Hey folks, David Stewart here. Time for some more StoryCraft. Today we're going to talk about magic systems. As requested, ask and ye shall receive. And I'm going to talk about three different kinds of magic systems that you can use and you will have probably seen in books. Now this is something that I have talked about at length before. I've done a video at this point years ago called Fantasy Does Not Excuse Impossibility, I think. Um, because one of the big mistakes people make when they're discussing fantasy or they're writing fantasy is they think that magic makes it so anything is possible and anything could happen at any time. And that's really a characteristic of a different genre called bizarro, where just things could happen randomly for any reason or no reason. Uh, a good writer will usually construct their story in such a way that um, the magic is not going to create a deus ex machina situation over and over again where things just happen to uh, to go a certain way because of magic and things can just be done because magic. Uh, rather, we box magic in in such a way that it doesn't affect the tension of the story. So there's three different kinds of magic systems that I want to talk to you about today. Um, the first one is fairy tale magic. The second one is sorcery. And the third one is RPG magic. And I'll give you some popular examples, I think, from all three. So fairy tale magic is, as you would expect, the kind of magic that you see in fairy tales. Fairy tale magic simply exists. It exists. It does things. It does whatever you want it to do in the story. Uh, that's the point of a lot of fairy tales. You have a fairy godmother who can turn mice into coachmen or whatever it happens to be. Or you have um, you know, a, a witch who can turn people into frogs. This magic exists on its own. It's not logical. Rather, it's from the fae. It's from fairies and therefore is usually something that's dangerous, unpredictable, and unexplainable. Now, the way that fairy tales tend to him in this magic is by almost always in fairy tales, you have the magic being executed by someone other than the protagonist. So the main character is not magical. The main character is normal, and it's the fairy godmother who does things, or it's the evil Rumpelstiltskin elf that does things. Um, it's the wicked witch who lives in the woods that does all of the magic. This is important because magic is a dangerous thing that you don't have control over as, uh, as a normal person and something that you should be wary of. This is where you get a lot of folk tales where you make maybe a deal with the devil or the deal with the sorcerer and it usually comes out uh, badly for you. So magic is something that's part of a supernatural and spiritual danger that exists in fairy tales. It's not something that's explainable. It's not something that has limits on it. Um, usually it will create uh, part of the conflict of a story and then it's up to uh, normal people to find a resolution however they're going to find it. So that's fairy tale magic. Now, broadly speaking, fairy tale magic exists very much outside of fairy tales. Uh, very popularly, you'll see it with things like Lord Dunsany, but also with J.R.R. Tolkien. One of the things that you'll notice with Tolkien's writings is that none of the main characters are magical. And that exception to that might be Gandalf. And the reason Gandalf is an exception is that he's present in all of the... <laughs> All of the books, right? He's there doing things and he's often doing magical things. But we're seeing the world more from the eyes of hobbits than from the eyes of Gandalf. We don't hop into Gandalf's head too often and have him think about what kind of magic or explain what kind of magic. Rather, it's the hobbits witnessing Gandalf doing some kind of magic. And he might say, you know, I put a closing spell on the door and the counter spell almost like destroyed me. Uh, when he's fighting the Balrog. So he mentions that he can do magic. He mentions that he knows spells, but we don't in the audience really understand them. Um, nor do we have an idea that the magic is going to uh, be predictable, like that Gandalf can magically magic people, like teleport them out of Moria or something like that. Magic occurs in somewhat unpredictable ways, and it doesn't really occur in a way that is... Um, is going to significantly alter most of the course of the story. Now, it does alter the course of the story because Gandalf is able to use fireworks, create smoke, disappear in some cases, you know, show up and kill the great goblin. He's able to do a lot of things with that magic to help drive the story forward in The Hobbit or uh, likewise in Lord of the Rings. Um, but the main point is that the 
the primary characters, the protagonists, whether it's like Aragorn or it's one of the hobbits, they don't have magic and they can't rely on that magic to do things for themselves. So that's fairy tale magic and uh, is popularly going to be seen in things like Tolkien. It's not intended to be explained. It's intended to be separate from the understanding of mortals. It's well outside of them. Gandalf, if you know the deeper lore, he's a Maiar, which is I don't know, kind of like a, a lowish angel, I might say, is what a Maiar is. So um, it's something a little bit different from what you would get in these other forms. So the, another one is sorcery. Uh, sorcery is, again, a kind of magic that is unexplained. However, it's not just generated from supernatural sources like being a Maiar spirit or being a fairy. Rather, it's something that people, mortals, gain through arcane knowledge or a deal with demons or spirits or the devils or the gods. Um, this is something that mortals can control through maybe, you know, arcane study. But it's likewise, like the uh, the fairy tale magic, somewhat unpredictable. Um, and it's in the kind of stories that feature sorcery, it's virtually never controlled by the main characters. So a really good example of this would be any of the Conan stories by Robert E. Howard, um, Fritz Leiber, um, Michael Moorcock. These uh, writers from the 20th century used magic in their fantasy settings, but what they didn't do is have the main characters be sorcerers. So maybe the, there's a magic ring that does something. Maybe the sorcerer calls upon snake demons or something like that. But it's Conan who kills the sorcerer. Uh, Conan is not the one doing the sorcery. He has the sword, and it's the sorcerer doing the sorcery. So the main characters are, in most cases, not magical. Now, if you're looking at Fritz Leiber stuff, uh, you have one of the characters who's a mage, but he can't just do magic magically. Magic has a cost. He may know how to like do some kind of simple spell. Um, Magic is used in some cases to forward the plot, to kind of push things forward, but it's more often a threat. It's the it's the sorcerer that we have to take down. Um, so it's a little more systematized than the fairy tale magic, which is really chaotic and it's intended to, uh, in a lot of ways, represent chaos or represent the divine or the dangers of the fae. In sorcery, we're looking at something that a person can control, but there's no there's no set rules about it because the origin of sorcery is predominantly divine it's not some natural system which is what we'll talk about in rpgs um, it's not a natural system that you can manipulate too too often at your own will rather it's something that you have to get from the gods or from arcane study with some master sorcerer and um, you get a couple of, of little bits of magic that you can maybe use here or there as we transition to this third one rpg magic i have to mention jack vance um, and the dying earth um the dying earth series where people can do magic, but they can only like memorize one spell at a time. So you put this really harsh limit around the sorcery. And uh, that's the beginnings of a, of a magic system, but it's what I would call a softer magic system. A softer magic system means that there's things that you can expect people to be able to do, but people really can't do a whole lot of magic. So they're not going to be able to use magic to just get out of any situation. They don't have an endless bag of spells for the protagonist to just blast through any um, any obstacle that presents themselves in a story. Um, on the softer magic side, I should also mention um, Harry Potter. Harry Potter is more like sorcery. So in the Harry Potter books, the children learn spells. The spells are what they are. The spells are passed down through arcane learning. They go to a uh, they go to a wizard school and they learn their little spells, and they have to hopefully memorize the spells. What they uh, what they don't have to deal with are things where like you can only do five spells a day and you can only do two spells a day. Like spells are just things you memorize. They're things you can use. Hopefully you remember how to use them. You've practiced them enough. There's a skill element to them. Um, so we're getting closer to this third uh, idea, which is an RPG magic system. Um, but really, the one of the big points about Harry Potter and one of the things that I think makes it work really well as far as how the magic works is that the children who are the main characters, uh, Harry Potter and his friends Hermione and Ron, they're not adults. They are children. They don't have a full knowledge of how magic is supposed to work. So uh, adults know a lot more. Adults are more like the fairy tale kind of magic, right? They just 
are able to do all of these amazing things. They're able to make the dishes wash themselves. I mean, able to make potatoes mash themselves. They can teleport here and there. Um, and so as the children gain more knowledge, they're, they have more tools at their disposal, but they still are looking at the adults as big threats. They don't know how Voldemort does certain things. They don't know all of his curses. They don't know all the magic he invents. So the adult world of magic is something that's inaccessible to them and threatening to them. And they have to be crafty like in a sword and sorcery tale and figure out how to uh, solve the plot with their limited tools that they have. You know, they're, they're like Akio spell and, uh, you know, those sorts of things and the potions that they learn to make. So we're getting towards that RPG thing, but it's still in the realm, I would say, of sorcery kind of magic a softer magic system where um if the author wants to she can add new spells new ways of doing things new elements to the magic system it's not a regulated uh false science like a made-up science so anyway when we get to the third one rpg magic now i'm calling it rp rpg magic because I think it's very influenced by dungeons and dragons and similar tabletop role-playing games and one of the things about playing a game is that games have rules. So in an RPG magic system, magic has rules. It has a really strict set of rules. And that strict set of rules has to be adhered to in order for the magic to work. Um, if you've ever played Dungeons & Dragons, whether it's first edition, I think first edition is maybe more influenced by Jack Vance. Uh, you know, you can do like one dispel one time a day. And as, until you get to third edition, where everything's highly systematized you can do magic in a certain way and if you uh have ever been influenced by video games where you have a mana pool like you do magic and it takes away some bar like some bar goes down as you do magic well we put that in a game because you have to manage a resource we manage resources in games that's one of the things we do so it makes sense that you have a resource called mana or mana that you can draw on to do magic but but you can't do unlimited magic um, you know, you have to you have to keep track of that mana pool. So anytime you have these well-regulated systems, you're dealing with something that is, my, in my opinion, is very RPG influenced. So the best examples of this are going to be Robert Jordan and Brandon Sanderson. They're the two like biggest examples I can give of this kind of regulated magic system. Um, Brandon Sanderson especially is really famous for his world building and his magic systems. Now, what's really clever about Brandon Sanderson, and I'm going to point this out because a lot of people miss this. They focus on allomancy is cool without realizing that allomancy provides the solution to the plot. So what's very clever about Sanderson's writing is that those complex magic systems that people like to, to think about in, in this RPG fashion, they aren't just there because. They're not just there to kind of have magic and maybe even to to like put some limits on what magical characters can do they're also there in a clever way to solve the plot so um, we have to figure out who the lord ruler is and you uncover that mystery by learning about the magic and the history of the magic system so the magic provides the solution to the plot in the mistborn series um, and that's a really good series to read if you want a, a really good example of this uh, allomancy has these hard and fast rules you have to eat the metal the metal provides a certain amount of energy to do allomancy you combine these different metals in certain ways each metal does something different and you learn that as if you are learning a tabletop rpg game um, it's very well regulated it's like a made-up second science that makes the world operate um, that's not to say it's like 100% bounded because that would be kind of defeat the point of magic. But it's really, really, really well regulated and you can expect as a reader that the characters are only going to be able to perform magic within the limits that the author has set up, which helps to keep a lot of tension in the scenes. We're not sure uh, if the characters are going to succeed because there's no magic that can give them a deus ex, a deus ex machina way to just magically get out of it. Um, and provides a little bit of uh, in-the-moment story tension and plot tension for what you happen to be doing. Are you going to run out of metal when you're doing allomancy? Or are you going to run out of energy from your from your little crystal marbles if you're if you're reading the um, if you're reading the something like Way of Kings, right? So these books, they're very, very good at that. And 
almost always the one of the solutions to the plot involves that element of world building. Um, so we really shouldn't overlook that. And I mentioned R Robert Jordan. Uh, this is because the Wheel of Time series is, in my opinion, it, it, there's a reflexive thing. It, it, it feels very RPG-like. There's this systematized uh, one power. There's a male and female side. There's certain things you can do with it. It's kind of on the transitionary thing. It's very sorcerous because you have to learn it, um, but it's also very systematized uh, as well. So you get something that I think leads naturally from maybe Jack Vance to Robert Jordan, and then finally you get to Brandon Sanderson. Um, now these are, are Western writers, but you're gonna see a lot of RPG magic systems if you're looking at the East. So if you are into manga or anime, you are going to see a lot of this stuff. If you're watching something like, uh, is it wrong to pick up girls in a dungeon? It's literally just RPG systems pasted into a story. There's even numbers involved with it. Um, you know, or something like, what was the one? Uh, Konosuba, I think. You know, they have like a card that has their, their RPG stats on it. So at that point, you're just being completely you're not hiding the rpg-ness of it at all it's just a story that the rpg is providing a, a a limiting framework for and helping to describe what characters are capable of doing um so it's very much literally an rpg system now so where did this systematized magic come from do you have to have it in my opinion you don't have to have it it came from um tabletop rpgs so a lot of authors played dungeons and dragons or you know, the One Ring role-playing game or GURPS or any of these cool games or even Vampire the Masquerade um, and are incorporating the ideas of how that affected the play and created stories at the table into their own books. They're influenced by how those systems affected the stories which they experienced or which emerged naturally if you're looking at old school D&D kind of emerged, kind of emergent gameplay. Um, the stories emerge from the gameplay. Uh, they were really enjoyed that aspect and are putting it into a story. And then finally, you get that last level of reflex where uh, maybe it's someone who hasn't really played RPGs at all, but maybe got interested in RPGs because they read someone like Brandon Sanderson. So, uh, of course, they're going to think that fantasy needs to have these these highly systematized systems now are highly systematized magic systems that are really regulated and really predictable um what are some other famous ones there's the force the force is really sorcery you learn the force the you commune with the force and the, it acts through you it's a divine power it's not something that's separate from the characters the main characters are using it but uh you know someone like luke skywalker doesn't have full control of the force he doesn't uh, you know he's not like this master of it so um i think especially in the original trilogy that little bit of separation you have a student that's learning it it's the same thing kind of like with harry potter is that luke doesn't know all the secrets of the force so darth vader of course is a big threat to him uh, so the force is in that middle area that sorcery if you're reading something like um chronicles of thomas covenant it's definitely in the sorcery area um you can do magic. It does certain things. Characters know how to do it. Uh, there's a system to it. It's really getting closer to the RPG element, but it's still something that is paid for. It's something that's learned through arcane lore, and it's not something that's really... There's no emphasis for the reader for how they're supposed to understand it. Um, and so, you know, oh, Malazan Book of the Fallen, this is more of like an RPG system as well. And I think the setting was actually developed by Erickson and Ian Eselmont originally as like a GURPS setting. So it makes a lot of sense that that would be an RPG magic system because it started as a tabletop RPG setting. How interesting is that? And there's uh, none of these are bad, by the way. They just have different effects on the story. So which one you're going to use in your story really depends on what kind of story you want to write and where the emphasis is and what kind of themes you want to use. If you're examining something like Michael Moorcock, if you're reading like the Elric series or something like that, the emphasis is not on um, a plot, like using sorcery to execute the plot. Rather, sorcery is something that's part of the total picture and the emphasis is really on Elric's personal moral journey and the consequences of his power. So he has this evil sword sword bringer that uh, you know one story not to I mean spoilers but uh you know it forces him to kill his friend to take a soul so it has power it can give him power to do something else so there's a high cost to the power it's not like a you know 
there's no mana bar, there's no virtual mana bar or anything like that. Rather, all of the, the magic and the sorcery exists to as part of the overall theme of Eric of Elric and his growth as a character. Um, so that's important to point out. And likewise, if you're looking at something like Conan, it's really to create a threat for Conan to solve, a problem for him to solve, not for him to like use it and learn it and you know count up numbers to do spells or something like that so um you know it really depends where the emphasis is do you is it a threat is it something that's part of a fairy tale that's like part of moral instruction um are you emphasizing the character's journey in which case you don't really need to emphasize the magic um are you emphasizing you know what part of the world do you want, really want to emphasize with the magic system that and then are you going to solve the plot what plot solutions are you going to use magic to solve because in something like harry potter magic's used very often in what's called Chekhov's gun so if you never heard Chekhov's gun it's this idea like you put a gun on the mantelpiece because you intend to fire it later in the story so you provide a solution to a problem earlier in the story so if you're watching if you're, if you're reading harry potter they learn spells which they use in later in the book or in other books you know uh, Akio Firebolt oh we learned that like in the first book and then he got his broom and then he could do stuff so there's all kinds of solutions to the problems that the kids face that are they exist in earlier stories they use Polyjuice Potion and it becomes a solution to the plot in the fourth book so something they figure out in the first book solves or is the I guess the mystery solution to uh, to something in the fourth book. All this stuff is done very good because J.K. Rowling is actually writing mystery books. So one of the successes of Harry Potter isn't just that it's fantasy and then it has this world that people really like and it has characters that they really like, but the plot format is really a mystery and magic provides some of the solutions to that mystery in the same way Chekhov's gun would, you know, putting a gun on the mantelpiece means that it gets fired later in the in the story to solve a problem. Um, so anyway, there's that. Give, leave me your thoughts down below on magic systems and what you think about them. Uh, this has been a rather long video on this, but I want to give a good solid base of information for people to think about who are maybe new to writing fantasy um, or maybe are not, uh, maybe their focus as a reader is in one area of the genre. Maybe they haven't read as far back as something like Lord Dunsany or um, maybe they haven't read Michael Moorcock or Robert E. Howard. Uh, maybe they're, they really like contemporary fantasy. That's going to be more of that RPG style. And it's good to know some of the other things that are there as well. Maybe they don't like the, maybe don't like the newer stuff. And it's like, how do I avoid that? Um, you know, why does the magic in Harry Potter work? Well, it's because the kids don't know, don't really know all the magic. Um, and because of Chekhov's gut. So anyway, I wanted to provide some, some information for that. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. The newest book, I don't even know if I have it here. It is called it is called Afterglow Generation Y. It's actually some short stories. There are some fantasy story things in there if you go ahead and read it. Most of it is um, in our world and is about you know kids born in the eighties, let's say. So anyway, check that one out. And of course, I have my fantasy books. You know, um, Shadow and Smoke. That's the latest one from the Moonsong trilogy. So. Go ahead and grab that one. The first one is called City of Silver. And hop on my mailing list at dbspress.com slash list. And I will see you all next time.